Welcome to Bench to Bedside, a weekly series of live conversations about recent advances in cancer, from the research bench to treatment at the patient's bedside. And now, your host and the director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, Dr. Roy Jensen. Welcome to Bench to Bedside. I'm Dr. Roy Jensen, director of the University of Kansas Cancer Center, and with me here today is Dr. Lori Spuzak, gynecologic oncologist, and Dr. Lauren Nye, breast medical oncologist at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Today, we are at the Women's Cancer Center at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Today, we're going to discuss the genetic link between breast, ovarian, and prostate cancers. We know that a mutation in either the BRCA1 or BRCA2 gene gives a woman an increased lifetime risk of developing breast and ovarian cancers. Men with these gene mutations also have an increased risk of breast cancer and prostate cancer. So Dr. Nye, what do we mean when we talk about a BRCA1 uh, mutation? And how do these uh, mutations lead to cancer? So when we're talking about any genetic mutation, we're talking about a change in someone's DNA that increases their risk for cancer. The BRCA1 mutation specifically is a misspelling in that gene in someone's DNA that basically doesn't allow their body to make the protective protein, which is BRCA1, that helps protect our body against developing cancer. So when someone has a mutation in a BRCA1 mutation, then they are at increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. So Usually, uh, when we think about BRCA1 mutations, uh, we think about the impact on women. Um, but men can also carry the BRCA1 mutation and pass it on to their children. So uh, what does it mean um, when a man is carrying a BRCA1 mutation? What impact does that have? So there's the BRCA1 and the BRCA2 mutation. More so with the BRCA2 mutation, we can see male breast cancer, prostate cancer, melanoma, and pancreatic cancer. So there are, there is a predisposition to cancer that can affect males as well as females. Mm -hmm. In addition, a male who harbors a BRCA mutation or any mutation can pass that mutation on to their offspring. So they have a 50% chance of passing that mutation down to their offspring. And if that's something that concerns them, there's things that they can consider before childbearing. Okay. So Dr. Spuzak, um, these mutations, how do they uh, specifically impact other types of, of women's cancers? These particular mutations not only affect the breast, they also affect uh, the ovaries. Um, and there's some suggestion that um, BRCA1 in particular can affect the uterus and increase your risk. Um, so that's what we're seeing when, when we see how these actually play out um, in our patients. Mm -hmm. So how, how did we discover the link between the breast and, and ovarian cancers? I should probably be asking you this question because you have a huge <laughs> role in, in the development of our understanding and our knowledge base about BRCA. Um, but as far as I understand the history, there's a very famous scientist, uh, Mary Claire King, who started, um, uh, who was a geneticist and uh, started tracking families um, uh, and found that there were families who had stories of multiple generations affected by breast ovarian cancer and what they're even finding now are links with prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer. Uh, melanomas um, and uh, started looking at why these families were different um, and uh, brought that to the lab um, and I, I guess that I would say the rest is history um, that's, that's um, exactly and, right. yeah yeah I think the key was um, uh, Dr. King focused on families that had a very high rate of breast and ovarian cancer and I think that was the key to uh, really isolating uh, the gene. Mm -hmm. So um, now, I think pretty much every time you sit down to watch the television, uh, you'll see uh, genetic testing kits that are available uh, to uh, consumers. And could you um, uh, tell us a little bit about those tests in, in particular, and, and what should someone do mm. if they discover that they have a mutant BRCA1 
gene when they're utilizing one of these consumer tests? Sure. Um, so I think it's amazing that we have this technology available to us. But what I would really encourage my patients is to not just trust Dr. Google um, to inform them about what they should do with this information. So number one, um, I would have them see their primary care doctor um, who then can refer them to a geneticist or a genetic counselor that can help them interpret that information. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the context of a BRCA mutation, that genetic counselor will be able to tell them, number one, is that a mutation that actually translates into a risk of cancer? Because there are some mutations called variants of uncertain significance that as far as we know right now, don't actually manifest as a cancer in that particular patient. They'll be able to interpret that gene and tell them what's their risk of, uh, of different types of cancers. So we've already been talking about the fact that there's breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, uterine, prostate, pancreas, and get them hooked up with the right physicians who are going to see them, assess their risk, and offer them the correct treatments for their particular gene condition. So it's really important once you get that information that you seek specialty care at a place like uh, the Women's Cancer Center here at KU or an, an NCI designated cancer center where you'll be able to be informed about uh, about all of the different risks that you have associated with what you have found in your home test and then what you can do about it. I would also exercise caution that mm. not all those home kits are created equal mm. or the best route to go for genetic mm. testing. They don't all fully sequence the BRCA1 mm. and BRCA2 genes and most of them don't include other genes that can be associated with breast, ovarian, mm -hmm. uterine, pancreatic cancer that could be significant in a family. Mm -hmm. So a negative test should not be reassuring. Mm -hmm. You should still probably talk to your doctor and seek out true genetic counseling and testing. I totally agree with that. Um, I think that's something that's really important to remember is that many of our patients with these family clusters of breast and ovarian cancer actually do not have a gene that we know about yet. Uh, that tests positive and we still have to be really sensitive to the fact that they have these huge family histories of cancer and honor that and and um, and screen them appropriately. Completely agree. I, I, uh, I agree as well and I think the, the point that both of you bring up um, emphasizing the role of genetic counseling is is absolutely critical. You know before these tests became commercially available it was um, almost considered malpractice mm. to engage in genetic testing and not have genetic counseling available mm. to your patient. And now, of course, it's almost it's standard practice uh, where a patient comes in, oh, I got a letter from such and such testing service and what do I do about it? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know that used to be the nightmare scenario mm -hmm. uh, 10 years ago. and. It probably happens every Unless week. That's the now. daily scenario. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you know, what should a um, a person do who under who finds out that someone in their family has tested positive uh, for one of these uh, hereditary cancer genes? They should talk to their primary care doctor or seek out a genetic counselor um, so that they can understand what they need to do, what action they need to take for genetic testing, and also understand their risk if that comes back negative. If you're just joining us, we're at the Women's Cancer Center at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments section. Remember to share this link with people you think might benefit from our discussion. Post with the hashtag, bench to bedside. So can you tell us uh, why um, really having a team available that can provide a coordinated uh, approach to care for these patients is, is absolutely critical uh, when either a patient or, or a family ha has been identified as, as having one of these hereditary cancer genes? Absolutely, so we are really lucky here at KU to have all of the specialists that we do and it was a big part of why I came back to KU to do breast cancer prevention. Um, so a lot of these mutations, most of these mutations aren't associated with an increased risk of just one cancer type. They're associated with an increased risk of many. Um, so the BRCA2 BRCA2 gene, for example, 
that's associated with an increased risk of breast, ovarian, prostate, pancreatic cancer. So here at KU, we have experts in all of those areas. So when a family comes in with a BRCA2 mutation, we get them set up in the high-risk breast clinic. We have them see our gynecologic oncologist to talk about screening and prevention for ovarian cancer or uterine cancer. And then we also have a high-risk prostate clinic where the men can undergo prostate cancer screening and prevention and a high-risk GI clinic where we have um, experts who can counsel them on what we have for pancreatic cancer screening and what's available to them. So how common is it to have all of these services uh, available outside of an NCI designated cancer center? I, not common at all. Yeah. I think that's the point. A hundred percent agree and also in the same space um, we now have uh, a physical space where we're sharing space where I can run down the hall um, and uh, one of the breast oncologists uh, will be available um, to see a patient urgently uh, if need be. Um, I can um, walk down the hall and I have a breast uh, surgery colleague who I can uh, plan a joint case with um, for a risk-reducing surgery. So uh, it's, it's a tremendous resource that we have here that's totally unique. So uh, you, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but um, why is it important for, a, say, a woman who has been identified to have a high risk for breast cancer to also be seen uh, by a gynecologic uh, oncologist? Um, so for example, in, in the context of BRCA, so your risk for breast cancer is high for both BRCA1 and 2 mutations. Um, but additionally, your risk of ovarian cancer, your lifetime risk is very high. So um, anywhere between 20 and 40 percent, depending on, on which mutation you're talking about. So what we need to plan is um, for where that patient is in her age, um, in her fertility uh, status, um, if she's uh, if she's decided she is um, still planning fertility or if she's uh, complete with her fertility, um, how we're going to negotiate her plan of care and kind of her options may be surveillance. So for example, a clinical exam, uh, transvaginal ultrasound and CA125 testing, which is a tumor marker in the blood. Um, it may be chemo prophylaxis for breast, that may be tamoxifen for, for a GYN malignancy risk reduction, that might be an oral contraceptive pill, mm -hmm. um, or a surgical risk reduction. And what that strategy looks like and when is gonna be different for every woman um, based on their particular needs and where they are in their life. So um, uh, for women uh, with uh, BRCA mutations, that may look like a risk-reducing removal of their tubes, ovaries, and possibly their uterus as well. Um, and all of that is an individualized conversation, and the timing of when that surgery should happen is also individualized because um, many of these women may come to us and we'll find their mutations in the context of cancer. So. For example, we, we share a number of patients who start off with breast cancer and then come to me for consultation about their ovarian cancer risk or vice versa. Uh, I'll have a patient with uh, an ovarian cancer that I've completed treatment with and I'll refer them to Dr. Nye to talk about their breast cancer risk. And when and how should we intervene with surveillance, uh, preventive surgery, uh, medications. It's, it's totally individualized. And between our two teams, there's a lot of talk of hormones and yes. avoiding hormones. Yeah. And yeah. the oral contraceptives come up a lot. Mm -hmm. And we as a high-risk breast clinic mm -hmm. absolutely support chemo prevention for ovarian cancer mm -hmm. with oral contraceptives. But a lot of patients need to be counseled on that's okay and that right. their breast cancer risk is not significantly elevated by that. And the same with hormone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. After after risk reducing mm -hmm. ophorectomy because we, you know, we're offering these surgeries to women who are well before the age of natural menopause, which would be, you know, fifty to fifty two. And so um, so we really are, are, are weighing the side effects of, of removing uh, their ovaries and putting them into a premature menopause with giving them ad uh, hormone therapy. And so far as we know, uh, giving ad therapy does not impact their, their risk of breast cancer. So you've uh, detailed a number of the risk reduction uh, strategies. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, maybe Dr. Nye, you could tell us about some of the trials that are available in the high-risk breast clinic uh, to potentially achieve some other means whereby we can reduce risk and not just through a surgical approach? So we have three open trials right now in our uh, high-risk breast clinic. The first is a trial of omega-3 fatty acid supplementation in premenopausal women who are still thinking about childbearing. So in women that are planning to have future children, they're not eligible for tamoxifen and they usually don't want to undergo a prophylactic mastectomy and there's been some data that omega-3 supplementation may be beneficial and when you have surges of hormones your breast cells actually take in that good omega-3 fatty acid so we're doing a pilot study in those individuals we are also participating in a national trial of metformin in premenopausal women at high risk for breast cancer which we've been a top recruiter for and women have really been pleased um, being on that study and then we have a study for postmenopausal women who are at increased risk for breast cancer and experiencing hot flashes uh, with a drug called Duave, which is a combination of a CIRM, which is a drug like tamoxifen that blocks est estrogen in the breast, combined with a low dose estrogen that takes away their hot flashes. And so they're very pleased on that study mm -hmm. as well. Um, we frequently do exercise or weight loss intervention studies as well because we know that's very important for breast cancer risk reduction. So we're always trying to bring clinical prevention trials that will benefit our patients. Okay. So uh, could you talk about maybe some of the side effects that, that might uh, take place in, in those trials? Um, well, the reason that we're doing these trials is because most women aren't interested in the side effects that come from our standard chemo prevention. So drugs like tamoxifen, raloxifene, or aromatase inhibitors are our standard chemo prevention, but they're typically associated with hot flashes, vaginal dryness, um, some risk of blood clots, some risk of uterine cancer, arthralgias, or osteoporosis. So we are looking for drugs that maybe have a more favorable side effect profile um, that will still be beneficial to patients. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nine, Dr. Spuzak. It's been a pleasure having you on Bench to Bedside today. Uh, that's all for today. Please join us next week at 10 a.m. Uh, when we talk about lymphoma, leukemia, and Hodgkin's disease with our blood cancer experts at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. Thank you and good day.